Mara Thomas, Editor-in-Chief of UrbanHealthToday.com, part of the DocWire family of medical news sites. And I want to thank you for tuning in to Urban Health Weekly. Our goal each week is to keep you informed of the latest in health and medical news right from today's headlines. It's time to empower yourself with open conversations about your medical care with news that matters to you. So are you ready? Let's get started. This is Urban Health Today, and I'm speaking with Dr. Chris Wusterhausen, a board-certified family practice physician and global lecturer who is certified in age management medicine. He's here to talk about GLP-1s and weight management for older patients. Thanks for talking with me today, Dr. Wusterhausen. Thank you, Tamara. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to have you here. All right, let's get started. Please talk about your background and your work in age management. First of all, what is age management medicine? So age management medicine is a term that a lot of people have different uh, definitions, but what I take it as is helping patients age gracefully. As I always tell patients, most of us aren't looking to just grow old. We're actually looking to grow older and healthy at the same time. So I like to use the term health span. We're trying to help our patients have a better health span. Uh, and so age management medicine is basically just trying to help our patients age gracefully, trying to minimize the use of medications if we can, and, you know, just overall trying to use the body to help heal itself. How do weight management strategies for older patients differ from those for younger patients? Well, so as we were talking earlier, I, I first always want to kind of think about what what is the definition older person, right? Because, uh, you know, I have some patients that are 70, 75 that are in such great health that they can run laps around some 40 year olds. And so I think that age is just a number and we have to look at not only the patient's chronologic age, but sometimes thinking about what their biologic age is. But for this purpose, I think let's kind of think of older patients, maybe as 60 and above. Um, and I think that when we're looking at weight management strategies, it's important that we take a multifaceted approach when we look at them. In other words, you know, what can they do exercise wise? What are they capable of doing? Do they have joint issues that won't let them do maybe things that younger patients can do? What kind of metabolic health issues do they have? Generally, for our older patients, we do need to take a little bit more of a cautious approach with those patients uh, because they probably are, I, I like the term, not as medically, uh, um, metabolically, excuse me, flexible as some of our younger patients sometimes can be, meaning they might be more likely to have some unwanted side effects. Maybe they, um, you know, are just not able to tolerate certain treatments like some of our younger patients uh, do. So it's just important that we show some signs of caution when we're treating this patient population. What percentage of your uh, patient population requests GLP-1s and, and where do you stand on the therapy? So GLP-1s, and if I could, I'd like to just kind of break down what is a GLP-1. I think it's important because not every, you know a lot of people hear GLP-1s and they know that it's semaglutide or, or you may know it as Ozempic or Abelsis or you know, Manjaro, right. Mm -hmm. Wigobi. And I just think it's important that maybe we back up just a second and talk about what, it, what that is. So my expertise is considered to be mainly in hormone therapy and peptide therapy and, and GOP ones are peptides. They're actually stand for glucagon like peptide one agonist. And they actually are a peptide is nothing more than amino acids in a chain and they cause actions in the body to either occur or to shut off. And so peptides, or in this case, GOP-1s, glucagon-like peptide-1 agonists, uh, are simply causing the hypothalamus of the brain to do a few things. A, it makes us feel full whenever we are, uh, when we eat less, which is really nice. Uh, it, it curbs cravings for sweets and alcohols in many of our, alcohol use in many of our patients. It makes us feel full more rapidly uh, but at the same time, like I said, cutting your appetite down. And then last but not least, it actually works on the insulin response because insulin or hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance, if you want to even call it that, is one of the main reasons that our patients, our, 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 our patient clientele gets overweight. So as far as my patients that maybe request GOP-1s, it's a fairly high number. I would say that my patients coming in for weight management, probably all of them are asking for a GLP-1. Not everybody that comes to my office, though, needs GLP-1s. Um, and, and so, you know, we have to look at each patient individually and kind of figure out who really would benefit from GLP-1 use. 
My stance on GLP ones, if you can't tell by my enthusiasm about the what they do, is is I, I love GLP ones. I, you know, one of the big things that's understated about GLP ones is how they help us long term. They down they down regulate neural degeneration in the brain. They improve cardiac function. They improve GI health. New studies are showing traumatic improvement in depression and anxiety. Uh, you know, I think it's really understated the the fact that these these peptides can be used long term, uh, and, and I think they're actually most useful in that scenarios. Now, of course, a lot of our patients' budgets won't allow for that because, unfortunately, they are expensive for many patients. Uh, but I, I get a lot of patients that come into my office and through either social media myths or from their friends have been told, you know, you got to get on it and get off of it as quickly as possible. And I just don't believe that to be the case. Uh, can I ask why not? Because of the long-term benefits that you can see, you know, I'm a patient that I plan on never coming off a of GLP one, unless we come up with something better. And that's because again, like I said, it's good for my brain. It's good for my heart. It's good for my gut. And it's good for my mental wellness. Uh, all of those things together are amazing reasons why GLP ones can be very good for us as we age. Out of curiosity, um, do you have any concern as a provider um, that patients will, for example, rely on GLP ones instead of helpful behaviors or or, or changing the the lifestyle? Well, so I think that that's where the provider comes into play. One of my one of my pet peeves about GLP ones, and I'm very excited about their popularity these days. But unfortunately, everybody's prescribing them now, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, every clinic practically is prescribing them. And I think that either lack of knowledge of how to truly use these GLP ones or simply lack of time. And what I mean by that is, is the, you know, the traditional medical system now where you have a 15 minute visit max for most of your insurance based practices. I many times think the the provider may have the knowledge. They simply don't have the time to really talk about nutrition and how these products are really used properly. Like in our office, every time a patient comes in for a weight loss visit, they get a body, a body scan where I can actually see their body composition, where I can see where every pound either went or, or was lost from. In other words, I can look at their muscle mass. I can look at their body fat, visceral fat, water weight. So if a person is using these GLP ones improperly, and what's my definition of improperly? Using a GLP one just to not eat, maybe. Okay. Like I'm just going to, you know, cut my appetite so much that I just don't eat or eat so little that I'm not eating the right foods. And if that's the case, you're going to see patients losing significant muscle mass. And in my practice, we harp, absolutely harp on patients that we're not trying to lose muscle. Very few of my patients lose any muscle on GLP ones. And that's because we're really stressing proper nutrition. So if you just give a person a GLP one and titrate it up to the dose where Tamara's appetite is cut way down, but you haven't taught that person how to eat properly, I absolutely agree with your statement that yes, I'm worried about the outcome of that patient. But if I'm monitoring that patient correctly through labs, through scans, uh, through educating these patients, my, my concern has been minimized at that point. Prior to the advent of GLP-1s, what therapies did you prescribe for weight management in your patients? Well, so, you know, we get back and I always joke, like, how do we traditionally have patients try to lose weight? And I always say, personally, you know, you, you say I'm going to start my diet on Monday, which typically means you gorge yourself on Sundays because your diet starts on Monday. And I always say, you know, as doctors, we try to educate our patients on eating less, eating better, uh, exercising more. The truth is, is that has pretty minimal results for many patients, especially if they're already in an insulin resistant state. And that's why it's really important to advocate to all the doctors and, and our providers. I'm going to change it to providers because I help train MPs and PAs as well. It's super important that you check the right labs, like a fasting insulin level. Um you know, as I always try to tell my patients, I haven't done my job properly. If you just show up, my if you've been seeing me a while and all of a sudden I just say, Bill, you're a diabetic. Well, that means I haven't been following the proper labs. I haven't been doing the proper education because we know when diabetes is starting to occur well before the A1C, which is the 90 day blood sugar test tells us you're a diabetic. 
And so, you know, before the advent of GLP-1s, it was dietary counseling, exercise counseling, hormone modification, uh, maybe sometimes appetite suppressants like your fentermines of the world, which, you know, I've never been a huge fan of because of the uh, side effect profile of those things. But, you know, that was the pretty traditional way that we helped uh, patients lose weight. The unfortunate aspect is I believe the success rate of that type of a program was pretty low. Patients got very frustrated very quickly. Um, and if they didn't see results within the first 30 days, the, the you know, the, the human mind is such that we're always looking for instant gratification. And if we didn't get that, many times these patients would simply fall off. So... How do you counsel your pre-diabetic patients? You know, the ones with the A1C that's under 6.2. Cause you talked about yes. your diabetic patients. Yeah. So in, in those insulin resistance patients, many times their A1C is completely normal. Their A1C may be 5.5, 5.6, which is a normal range, but their fasting insulin level will be severely elevated. That's where you first see insulin resistance is at your fasting insulin level. And I have a saying that I tell all of my patients is that if your insulin is up, metabolism is down. Uh, fat, you know, high insulin levels and 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 you know around the clock uh, doesn't equal uh, good metabolism and weight loss. Mm. So we must go after that. The, we must first, you know, rectify that uh, hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance. We can use those terms uh, interchangeably. And GOP ones is one way to combat that, but also really, and my strategy is going to be the same in an insulin resistance patient or a non-insulin resistance patient. It's just in an insulin resistance patient, I tell them we're not going to see his results as fast. That's why it's important for me to find that so that I don't have the patient. Let's take this theoretical bill patient that I'm seeing, you know, and bill has hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance. He needs to understand that we're gonna have to we're gonna have to tackle that first with proper diet. But I'm teaching proper diet to all of my patients. Fasting, I'm a huge proponent of fasting. Fasting is a great way to go after hyperinsulinemia, along possibly with a GLP-1 and exercise. And he just needs to realize that it's going to be a little slower going, a little, little, little tougher sledding in the beginning uh, to get that patient starting to lose weight versus maybe his buddy comes in and he's not hyperinsulinemic and is just as overweight. It can be frustrating because patients talk and Bill's talking to Bob and Bob's losing weight fast and Bill isn't. He needs to understand why that is. Yeah, the reason I asked is because um, you have some instances where providers, I'm not saying you, but providers, they will monitor the A1C, but then what they'll do is they'll say, okay, we'll wait until you get into the diabetes portion of your <laughs> A1C to take any action. And that does happen. So I was just wondering, you know, what 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 a provider should do to head that off at the pass, rather yes. than trying on. Yeah, it. unfortunately, and so I'm not going to throw any doctor under the bus, okay? Because that no, was no, me. I'm not asking you. No, 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 no. Let, let, let me answer it the way I was going to answer it because I think okay. you'll 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 agree with me, okay? And that is is that that's how I used to pr practice. It was until oh. it well because we didn't know any better. We weren't looking at insulin levels. I, I didn't know about looking at insulin levels. Okay. Now we would always maybe not to the extreme that you said. I would always try to nutritionally counsel my patients. Okay. And and, and I have a point I, I want to make. Whenever I first went into medicine, I've been in medicine now for 25 years. The the American Diabetes Association's protocol for type two diabetes new onset, the first treatment step was nutritional counseling. If you look at the American Diabetes Association right now, the first step is medication. Nowhere on there is nutritional counseling. Mm -hmm. uh, it's simply gone. And that's because I think a lot of providers have really given up on counseling their patients to eat better and do better, which I think that that can be true with a lot of our patients. I hate to say this, but a lot of patients are looking for a prescription. They're not looking to actually change their lives. The good news for my practice is, I always say is, Maybe it's a small percentage that's looking for what I do, but that's a big number at the end of the day because, you know, there is a, a growing population that doesn't just want to take more medicines any longer. They want to fix problems. And type 2 diabetes, or I'm going to back it up, insulin resistance, which is before type 2 diabetes, is completely reversible. 
So what I meant by my statement was, is I would give them nutritional counseling and I would try to do things and I would simply watch them. And at A1C goes up and up and up until they're finally diabetic. And it's like, well, I give up now. Here's your metformin and your actose and your whatever, okay, for your diabetes. Right. Now we're heading that off before we get to the pass. We're, we're seeing A1Cs that are normal, but we're looking at insulin levels that are elevated. And the good news is, is it's a whole lot easier to fix the problem when we find it at that stage versus, you know, now the A1C 6.2 or, or something of that nature. We certainly do see that. I'm not trying to say that we don't, but on a daily basis, I people see new patients that are hyper. I would say 50% of my new patients are hyperinsulinemic. And they've been seeing a doctor or a provider, let's use the term provider, they've been seeing a provider who doesn't check those labs. And, and that's why one of my mantras to my patients is, is a fasting insulin level is a cheap and expensive thing to check on your patients that gives you so much insight on how to properly combat these things with these patients. So as I was saying, my approach is really going to be the same in a non-hyperinsulinemic patient and a hyperinsulinemic patient. It's just now giving my patients the proper time frames to understand what we're working with. Regarding GLP-1s for weight management, how do the efficacy and safety profiles change for older adults? You know, so again, I think we just have to be a little bit more careful with these older, with these patients as we age. Um, and maybe it's more important that we also really uh, educate them more strictly. Um, and what I mean by that is, is as we age, it is one of the most common issues that, well, frailty. So I always say one of the most common things that can happen as we age is we become frail. But let's let's take that back in a medical term. They become sarcopenic. Sarcopenic means loss of muscle mass. And one of the big focuses of our clinic is to not allow patients to become sarcopenic. Sarcopenia typically occurs before osteopenia or porosis, loss of bone, okay? So if we can keep the muscle on, it's very unlikely that we ever have frail bones. And as I always tell my patients, there's a point in our life, if we live long enough, we store up muscle and then we're going to start pulling for muscle. I always tell my patients that money is the currency of retirement, muscle is the currency of aging, Mm. So a patient on a GOP-1 and they start eating a lot less and they're not eating properly, they're not getting their protein in, they're just eating the side salad with some asparagus and they're not eating something with protein, we must have protein in our body. So guess where that protein is going to be pulled from? It's going to be pulled from muscle. Right. And that's whenever you hear, and this is a social media myth I hear a lot. If you're an older patient and you take a GLP-1 agonist, you will lose muscle. And that is not, tr it is true, but it's not true. It's not true if you follow proper diet. It is true if you don't follow proper diet. And that's why I always say, in my practice, every one of my patients, old or young, older, we'll use the term older uh, or young, I will simply not continue them if they start to lose significant muscle mass. Um, you know, I'm saying, hey, I'll give them, a, I'll give them a warning. Like, hey, Bill, uh, this month you lost way more muscle than I would have liked to have seen. If this happens again, I'm going to probably have to take you off of this. Let's re-educate on what the expectations are. The good news is, is I can count on one hand how many times I've had to take a patient off of a GLP-1 secondary to muscle loss. Most of my patients lose no muscle. Some even gain a little muscle during the process because I've got them moving more than they were before. Because it's important to remember that GLP-1s alone is not going to fix your weight issue. It's a tool. I always say it's a great tool in our toolbox for weight loss. We still got to move. We're meant to be moving uh, human beings. We can't right. that in terror. We must move. We must work on our diet. And I think you had said earlier, are you concerned about some of your patients not eating better or adopting new uh, lifestyles? Absolutely. And that's why we constantly educate on the roles of fasting in our patients, on exercise in our patient, on proper sleep, on hormone mod modifications, things like that. Can you talk more about the fasting? What, what do you mean by that? So I'm a huge advocate of fasting, okay? And so especially in my weight loss patients. And one of, my, one of, one of the ways that I think the one of the best ways you can keep weight off is actually fasting. So we always say, let's, fir let's first... Let's first define fasting. We all know when the doctor says, you know, don't eat after midnight because you got a blood draw in the morning. Okay, fine. 
uh, but we're wanting to time our fasting. So we like for our patients, if they don't have a contraindication, let's put that out there. Okay. There could be some contraindications to fasting. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly individually look at my patients to see one of the most common uh, contraindications would be insulin using diabetics more in the type ones or some of your type twos that use insulin. That might be a contraindication. Okay. But most of my patients don't have contraindications. So I'm wanting them to go at least five days a week, 16 plus hours a day, continuous without consuming any type of calories. So I let them have water, black coffee, unsweet tea. And typically, like, let's say you have a normal schedule, that would mean that you would start your feeding at noon, you know, normal lunchtime, and then you could eat up until 8 p.m. And 8 p.m. to 12 noon the next day, you consume only water, black coffee, unsweet tea. It's also a medically proven fact that if you fast routinely, you're going to find yourself with more energy. You're going to be able to jump higher, run faster. You're going to get sick less because your immune modulation is going to improve. And the biggest thing is we go back to is if you're not eating for extended period of time, especially if you're not insulin resistant, your insulin levels are going to fall very, very low, which you remember what I said my saying was if insulin's up, metabolism is down. So if insulin is low, metabolism is up allowing yourself to have better metabolism and forcing your body to start using fat for fuel. A lot of patients don't understand that as we age, our bodies don't want to use fat for fuel. It wants to save it for a rainy day. Right. As I always joke, our body doesn't know we're in 2024 and there's a grocery store on every corner. It still thinks we're cavemen and cave women. And unless I'm able to club something over the head and, and cook it today or find a bush that grows something that I can eat, that I may go long periods of time without eating. And our body wants to hold on to that fat until we force it by fasting uh, to use that fat for fuel. So, and then, but once we can start that process again, the body will then start to adapt and use fat for fuel. So one of the great ways I tell my patients is when we get to the weight we want to, because what we don't want to occur with these patients, and I completely agree with this statement I hear, we don't want to just get our patients to lose 30 pounds, take them off the GLP-1, and seven months later, they've gained the 30 pounds back. And I tell them, my patients, if we're going to do that, let's, let's not even do that. That's too hard on our bodies. So it's up to me or up to the provider to educate these patients on how to keep this from happening again. Uh, so that their patients do good long term. Now, that doesn't mean every one of my patients does it. You know, I mean, all we can do at the end of the day is educate. But if you educate properly, you can have much better success. Well, it sounds like you just described intermittent fasting, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's what I mean is intermittent fasting. Now, I, I certainly have patients that do longer fast, you know, but I always say just plain old intermittent fasting is a great thing. It's it's easy. It's easy to do. If you're on a GLP-1, you're not hungry enough to really be a problem. You should be able to go 16 hours. So that problem's not there. And certainly some of my patients do it more advanced fasting where you go maybe 40 hours occasionally. Uh, heck, I, I, you know, I try to do a 72 hour water only fast every six months. I mean, there's there's different forms of fasting, but the good old intermittent 16, eight uh, fasting is easy and very effective for most patients. How do weight management approaches in GLP-1 therapy differ between patients with chronic medical conditions versus other patient populations? It kind of goes back to just like age. And, and, you know, certainly as our patients age, they're more likely to have chronic medical conditions. And, you know, it's just really important that you monitor those patients a little bit more closely, because I think that that's going to be the population that might be more likely to have issues, especially one of the big issues I see is titration. Uh, again, going back to so many providers uh, using GLP-1s, I think there's pros and cons to that. And one of the big cons is I see a lot of patients getting sick. You know, what are the most common side effects of GLP-1s? It's, it's headache, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or constipation. And, you know, how do you avoid those things? Well, some patients are going to have those no matter what, but it's all about the titration. I always say low and slow. We start them low and we go up slow. And especially if they are older or have chronic medical conditions, we need to, to you know, uh, follow that uh, very, very closely. As I tell my um, older or my chronic patients, uh, it doesn't matter if you're 350 pounds or 150 pounds. I'm going to start you at the same low dose and we're going to slowly go up because I don't. The problem with like the injectable is it's a week long injection. So if I make you sick, you're probably going to be sick off and on for a week. I can't pull that shot back once it's there. Um, and, and so it's just important that we 
uh, go low and slow for all of our patients, but especially those ones with chronic medical conditions. Now, when you say titration, that means dosing, right? Making yeah, sure so matter. there's a wide range of dosing with uh, semi-glutide, which is your ozempic, rabelsis, or uh, terzepatide, manjaro. And, um, you know, that's one of the advantages of manjaro is at least there's not quite as many doses. But you have to start low because... Again, I might have a 300 pound person that responds to a half a milligram of semaglutide. In other words, gets significant appetite reduction and uh, does very well. Whereas maybe a 140 pound person may need a milligram or more. So there's no universal like this dose works for every patient. And again, that's one of the common uh, you know, patients that I get, oh, I took that. It made me really, really sick. And many times I'll say, let's call the pharmacy and see what dose you were given. I'm like, oh my God, like I wouldn't have had you on that dose for six to eight weeks. And they started you on that dose. Uh, no wonder it made you sick. Uh, and so that's just where education, making sure that if you are going to try a GOP-1 therapy, uh, that you have a provider that's well-versed in how to use it. How do health disparities impact the general approach to weight management and GLP-1 therapy in older patients? Yeah, again, you know, I think it kind of goes back to the to the mantra that we're talking about here is just, you know, certainly a patient that's older, certainly a patient with chronic conditions. Uh, maybe they're not even older. They're just young and have a lot of medical problems. I'm, I'm going to take a more cautious approach with those patients versus a young person that had that's not insulin resistant that doesn't have any chronic medical conditions i think that i can uh go after their weight loss maybe a little more aggressively might be the term uh but still within reason right um th that's something that's a clinical feel with your provider uh, i'm just going to have a more conservative approach whenever i have a 30 something year old person versus a 75 year old uh, no matter what what phase of life they're in. I, I need to be a little bit more cautious with those patients. I need to also educate them. Uh, I need to educate all of my patients properly, but I really need to make sure that my, my, my senior patients are locked in on how to eat properly. Maybe I monitor them a little bit more closely too. You know, maybe instead of saying, Hey, come back in two months, I'm just like, Hey, come back in two to four weeks and make sure I'm monitoring them very, very closely. Uh, most of my patients kind of graduate at some point to where they don't have to come as often once I truly feel confident that they know what they're doing. And I start all my patients out on a two to four week follow ups. And then they slowly graduate to 60 days and then ultimately 90 days, no, no longer than 90 for me uh, for weight management. But um, I let them graduate as I feel that they have the comfort level for both sides, that they're comfortable, I'm comfortable, uh, that everything's going the way it should. That patient that that comes to you and they say, Dr. Boosterhouse, and um, you know, I know I'm not necessarily obese, but I feel like I can stand to lose that extra 10 pounds to fit into my suit or my cocktail dress. What do you what do you how do you approach those patients? Uh, and I'm, you know, so I, first of all, in my practice, we're going to look at a body scan and see if they really have weight to lose. So I might be way more aggressive than the average provider because I believe optimal. Uh, I, I think I'm going to be missing the boat if I make my patients be obese before I treat their weight. OK, um, and so as a as a age management medicine physician, I'm also a, I also consider myself a cellular medicine physician. I know that any extra weight is bad. Uh, we're all meant to be a certain weight, uh, and, and that's where we're going to function the best. And so if I, you know, obviously, if I look at their body scan, I go, your body scan is perfect. Like, you know, you have no weight to lose, then no, I'm not going to proceed with that. But if these patients really are simply overweight, we know that you can be as simply as 10 or 15 pounds overweight long term and become insulin resistant and then ultimately become diabetic. You, you know, this thought that some people have is that you have to be obese to become type two by diabetic. That's simply not true. And so we know that visceral fat, that fat around our organs, okay, uh, which can happen with a simple 10 or 10 or 15 pound being overweight. So we look at visceral fat. That's really what we hone in on is visceral fat. And if your visceral fat is elevated, we're going to treat if they're a candidate because we know that vi increased visceral fat uh, is certainly if you're obese, you're going to have increased visceral fat, right? That that goes without being said. 
But if you have increased visceral fat, we know that you're in, you're you're an increased risk for all chronic medical conditions, including cancer, strokes, heart attacks, diabetes, high blood pressure. And so, as a as a doctor who truly truly believes that the best job I can do for my patients is avoiding chronic medical conditions, not waiting. You know, it's it was kind of one of your first questions, and I say I didn't used to do a very good job of that. And that's why I changed my philosophy. I was thirty five percent body fat at one point in my life, and and that's what kind of started this practice. Is I realized I wasn't even taking care of myself, much less was I taking care of my patients properly. Mm. What happens when a patient on GLP ones plateau? How do you adjust that patient's weight loss plan once they've met their health and weight loss goals? Okay, so I would say that's probably I could approach that question two different ways. One is plateaus. In other words, we're not at goal and plateaus at goal. So mm -hmm. if I could, I think those are those would be two different good good way to answer those in two different directions. Uh, if I could, let's start off that we've reached our goals. We've plateaued. We've done great. You know, everything's fine. Um, you know, I tell patients that there's a multitude of ways to approach that. A, we can uh, hopefully use all of the new found weight loss techniques that we've taught our patients, eating smaller portions, timing of foods. You know, it's even important if we can that we eat our foods in a certain order. You know, if you eat your proteins first and it followed by your your, you know, your simple carbs followed by your starchy carbs, you'll actually get a better, uh, less weight gain, uh, a bad weight gain that way. Uh, fasting, mixing in fasting, hopefully exercising again, hopefully our patients are moving again. We can simply take them off the GOP ones and say, okay, uh, Tamara, I think you've learned everything you need to learn. You're good to go, you know, and continue monitoring these patients. And I say, Hey, if we see a certain amount of weight loss, weight gain, excuse me, bad weight gain, then we probably need to get back in the office and maybe we need to use a GLP-1 for a month. Like, let's say Bill again goes on a Mediterranean cruise for two weeks and he eats very lavishly and doesn't exercise and follows it back up like we usually do from a vacation and doesn't exercise for the next month. And, you know, he wakes up six months later and has gained eight pounds. Let's go ahead and get in the office and, and get those eight pounds back off with a GOP one for a month or two versus letting the 30 pounds come back and then approaching it. Uh, let's be fasting. Let's let's do all of these things that we've we've learned or lowering the dose, finding that dose of GOP one if they can afford to that cuts their appetite and, and uh, cravings down enough that they don't that they're not losing, but they're not gaining again because of those long term positive effects on the brain, the heart, the gut, the mental health. OK, th those are potential uh, ways of looking at it. But then what we also see a lot in our office is the patient that hasn't got to goal, but they've plateaued, you know, and, and those patients you really have to look at individually. You can't you can't really answer that with a one one answer question. Why have they plateaued? Have they plateaued maybe because they have not been like going back to one of your original statements? They really haven't been doing good on their diet. They just haven't been eating as much, so they lost some weight, and we need really, the good news, I have great relationships with my patients, and for the most part, I think they tell me the truth, and typically <laughs> after about 10 minutes of talking with them and joking and like, hey, so what's really going on? Oh, doc, I, you know, I haven't, I've been eating less, but the quality still kind of sucks, and, you know, and that's where we got to tease out why have we plateaued? You know, are we not exercising? Are we still not eating properly? And then trying to get a approach for that individual patient that can get that weight loss going again. Maybe the dose is inaccurate. Maybe the dose is, you know, some tolerance has occurred. What we do know on GOP ones many times, if they're if they're on it for a long period of times, we'll start to see some tolerance build up with these products. And so, um, you know, somebody that's been on it 12 months, 15 months, you know, the, the study that everybody uses was 15 months long and they saw a 15% average weight loss with that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's about the time where it's maybe time to change it up, do something different with those patients. So those ones that plateau and are not at goal, those just have to be taken individually. And that's where a provider just needs to do a really good job with uh, talking to their, to their patient. What educational strategies do you find most effective in communicating the benefits of GLP-1 therapies to older patients? Face-to-face -face education I find to be the best. And so all of my new patients are, are, are patients that I'm going to put on GLP-1s. We start with a one-hour visit. We spend a significant amount of time of, of setting realistic expectations and also setting goals of how we're going to get to those, uh, setting a plan in place of how we're going to get to those goals. 
like a new patient that I saw the other day and she had been in another practice on weight loss, GLP-1 weight loss therapy for a year. And after my one month or one hour visit, she said that she was going monthly for a year. And in one hour, I gave her more education than she got gotten a year uh, from her prior uh, clinic. And that's because I really believe that if a patient understands and feels part of the plan, like here's your homework. Uh, this is, I'm not here to just simply write a medication and you're going to lose weight. It's not that easy. I wish it was. It is not that easy. Uh, GLP ones do make weight loss easier, but I never say it makes it easy. There's still a lot of work that has to be put in. We still have to make good choices. GLP ones aren't going to take every single craving you have away. It's not going, you can still eat through it too. Even though if your appetite's down, you can still eat through these GLP ones is what I always say. It's no different than somebody that maybe has a, 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 a surgery like a bypass or a gastric banding, you can still find ways to not lose weight on those surgeries. So I still, I still prefer face-to-face -face education and spending the appropriate amount of time with those patients. And every visit after that, I always say we build upon that plan. We do a, we do a quick recap from the last visit. Hey, this is what we talked about last time. How are you doing with that? How's it going with fasting? How's it going with your exercise? Uh, and then, you know, continuing to re-educate each time. Is there concern after extended period of use, I don't know, say 12, 18, 24 months, that the, the body will no longer do its job of um, regulating insulin, regulating weight? No, I've heard that. And that's never been shown in studies. And and actually, I see the exact opposite with that. You know, these products are helping with that. And I, I've heard people say your body is going to become dependent upon that. And that's simply not been seen. Uh, these products are, Manjaro is new, but it's important to remember these other products are not new. These aren't new peptides. Mm -hmm. They've been out over a decade. Uh, only Manjaro is new to market. It's just that, you know, whenever they found GLP-1s in the, by the way, they were found in the saliva of the Gila monsters where GLP-1s were found and they injected it into diabetic induced mice. And they found that these mice had better blood sugar control and that they got skinny. Well, guess where Big Pharma took it first? They took it to diabetes. You know, that's a billion, multi-billion dollar industry. So they went after the diabetic market and then, oh, by the way, there's this weight loss associated with it, which then they eventually kind of, you know, 180 and went after the weight loss market. Because what we see is weight loss is more rapid and more pronounced in the non-diabetic patients. And so, no, I, I actually think the benefits highly outweigh the negatives for these products long term, as we've already discussed. Hmm. Have you been following the, the studies on the use of GLP-1 for alcohol abuse? Mm -hmm. I have. And I've actually had success in my own practice. And, and by the way, that's not a patient population that I uh, really cater towards, but I've had a couple of alcoholics I was just that, that were very adamant about the fact that they weren't going to go to rehab. They couldn't go to rehab and that. And one guy in particular was drinking a 12 pack plus a day and within a month was not drinking at all. And to this day has still successfully come off of alcohol because of GLP-1 use. And so, yeah, that's where you're looking at the addiction, you know, how it's helping with addictions. It's the same way as looking at the help with depression and anxiety. Um, these are, I, I like to tell my patients, I believe GLP-1s are, are practically miracle drugs, except they do have a significant amount of side effects short term. And, and so a lot of patients have to be, you know, really coaxed through those first few weeks of being on uh, a, a GLP-1 with the GI side effects, fatigue, headache, that sort of thing that can occur with some of our patients. Have you found, um, they call it for a while, they call it ozempic face, where the <laughs> tissue in the face, have you found that uh, in any of your patients? In my case, in my patients, no. So, but I'd like to explain what is ozempic face. Mm -hmm. Ozempic face is where you have a patient that loses a significant amount of weight, okay? And especially muscle mass at the same time. And their skin's gonna get drapey because, you know, fat and muscle's a filler. And so, you know, if you have somebody that really loses significant amount of weight, like let's say 150 pounds, then sure, their skin's not gonna look as tight and you're gonna see that ozempic face, they say. That's not really the clientele that I cater to, although we do have some morbidly obese patients that we help. Um, mm -hmm. For the most 
but for the most cause, I find that if they don't lose muscle, uh, they don't get the ozempic face. I, I really haven't seen that in my clients. I haven't had anybody complain at the end that, like, oh my God, I lost all this weight, but now I look 10 years older because look how drapey my skin is. Uh, but I hear it talked about a lot and I could see how it could occur if you're not properly watching those patients or Maybe the provider is doing everything they should, but the patient just loses a significant amount of weight. It's no different than, you know, maybe somebody that was morbidly obese and they have their uh, gastric bypass done and they lose 200 pounds. You know, those patients certainly, uh, you know, at some point may have to consider, you know, some sort of, you know, skin resection. The same thing can happen if you're losing the weight with a GLP-1 for those morbidly or super obese patients. Hmm. Looking forward, what advancements in weight management and GLP-1 therapy are you most excited about? I'm just mainly excited about where medicine is headed now, especially with peptide therapy again, which is what GLP-1s are. We're, we're starting to really go back to root cause medicine, which is what I've always preached over the last 15 years, which means let's let the body heal itself. Let's not always, yes, GLP-1s are a medication. I agree but they're not your traditional medications, at least not what I mean by that. They're actually causing the body to help heal itself. And I think that's what I'm most excited about is actually trying to reverse conditions in patients and cure conditions in patients instead of just giving a medication to make the symptoms of the, of the, of the condition go away. You know, because how have we normally treated insulin resistance and diabetes? Well, you know, and that was a great question you threw in at the beginning. You know, we typically do a little nutritional counseling, which now doesn't really happen that much anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we just let them become diabetics. And it's like, oh, well, now, Bill, you're a diabetic. So here's your metformin. Here's the here's your statin. Here's your high blood pressure medicine, because now you got high blood pressure. And we're just going to try to control it. I think now with these GLP-1s, there's a really big focus on medicine and realizing that we can actually truly reverse some of these conditions and not just be accepting that this is just the way it is. And I think that's what excites me the most. I think that's remarkable, though, that um, nutritional counseling is no longer the first step um, that's recommended. Why do you think that's changed? I think because it was a combination of two things. And by the way, that happened a long, long time ago. That wasn't recently, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that it was a combination of a couple of things. A, uh, lack of success, uh, you know, providers seeing over and over that it just wasn't, uh, or the American Diabetes Association seeing it wasn't working. Uh, B, uh, time management, uh, simply, you know, um, your traditional family practice internal medicine doctor has got to see 30 plus patients a day to get things done. Um, and I think that's why ultimately less and less uh, time has been spent on nutritional counseling. Um, and I think that it, at some point it just became, it just kind of fell to the wayside. Um, and, and so that's what nowadays makes me most excited is about finding patient populations that really do want that counseling and actually intend on doing something with that counseling that you're getting, giving them so that I remain excited about doing it because, you know, you shouldn't be in this business if you don't like seeing your patients get better. Do you counsel patients at all about um, the role of processed food in the yeah. Yeah, we try to talk about how, um, you know, like one of the simple statements I always make, it's best when you go to the grocery store, let's shop on the periphery, let's stay off the aisles the best we can. Uh, mm -hmm. If it comes in a bag or a box, it's not good for us. If we can stay fresh, whether you're a vegan or a, 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 a carnivore, I always say every diet can be bad. Every diet can be good. I actually personally don't like the word diet. I like you know, I like lifestyles and your lifestyle may be different than mine, but we can, we can still make every lifestyle healthy if we work together. So I, I don't promote one way of doing anything. I always say the, the really the best diets, if you're really good into it is, is rotating diets. You know, I'm, I'm Mediterranean for three months and then I went carnivore for a couple of months. Keep your body guessing. It's, you know, it, it's really what's best metabolically. I'm too simple of an eater for that. I would never be able to survive in that environment, or at least that's what I tell myself. But yeah, sure, certainly processed foods, um, you know, not to get too far down this rabbit hole, but, you know, uh, pro our processed foods in our government, th these foods aren't meant to keep us healthy. Uh, these foods are horrible for us. And the more we can stay away from processed foods and stay with, you know, uh, organic and and properly 
grown or raised foods is the is the better we're off we're going to be long term for sure i wouldn't survive either i i have um i i keep a very simple diet because i have too many um food allergies so so yeah, you know, yeah. my wife will tell you i'm one of the pickiest eaters ever but what i do what i do works for me and and again try to stay it just I always say, you know, kind of like the book, keep it simple, stupid, you know, kiss, you know, like, let's just, let's put small things into our life that we can live by. And, you know, like staying out of fast food lines, you know, uh, staying away from bags and boxes, trying to really prepare our foods, uh, food prepping. Uh, those are really simple things, or, or at least buying foods that we know are prepped in the right way. These days, there's tons of businesses that do that, that can help us, but also understanding labels, like, you know, understanding what we're buying. There's, our American population can be tricked with just a few words. Just because something says organic on it doesn't mean it's good. Just because something says fat free doesn't mean it's good. Um, you know, and so it's important to understand that organic candy is no better for us than non-organic candy. It's still candy at the end of the day. And let's not be tricked so by these words, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just because something's fat free doesn't mean it's good for us either. You know, there's good fats, bad fats, and you know, it's not the point of the conversation, but just understanding these buzzwords that, you know, are put on foods and not falling for it. You know, I try to teach all my patients how to flip a label over. Like I had a customer not too long ago that, that was tricked by a high protein cookie for breakfast. That's literally what it said, high protein cookie. And mm -hmm. it was a freaking cookie. Um, you know, I mean, yes, they put a little more protein in it, but the carbs highly out, the carbs and the sugars highly outweighed that little bit of protein. You know, my, my, my pet pee, the protein shake, you know, you go down to your local smoothie bar and they, they put protein shake on something, but you know, it's got 45 net grams of carbs and 12 grams of protein. I always say that's a milkshake. That is not a protein shake. And so we can't get fooled by these things. Right. Uh, you know, I, I understand it tasted good. It should have, it was a milkshake uh, and, and making sure our patients truly understand how to be advocates for themselves, uh, no matter if they're young or old. Dr. Chris Wustenhauser, thank you so much for talking with me today and for making your patients healthy. Well, thanks for uh, spending a few minutes with me as well. It was quite lovely. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Urban Health Weekly today. I hope you'll join me and my friends next week so you can stay informed and inspired to take control of your health. See you next time.